Welcome to Russell Jones Speaks, where we explore big issues that matter to parents, grandparents, and kids. We tackle intergenerational issues. Everything that affects parents, grands, and children is on the table. That includes health and fitness, relationships, attitude, family unity, vision, adversity, God, and anything else that might arise. The goal is for you to take away something that you can use in your life immediately. David DeNataris is an accomplished professional, thought leader, and author who happens to be totally blind. In spite of adversity, David has built his success on resilience in both corporate and private life. He has led statewide agencies such as the New Jersey Department of Human Services and the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, and is also the author of Feeling Your Way Through Life, where he shares important stories describing how he was able to overcome the diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa when he was four years old. Today, he is a sought-after motivational speaker, assisting leaders and corporations in successfully overcoming challenges and setbacks. David's humor, high energy, and passion for life help audiences develop mindsets to approach times of adversity with a fresh perspective and the skills to move through times of disruption with success and energy. So welcome, David. Russ, it's a privilege to be with you today, my friend. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, just to kick this thing off, I, I'm fired up because I know a lot of your story. I, I know people are just going to really be blessed by um, what's going to come out of this. And I think the I'd like to start out with, and, and there's a reason for it, because I think when we as parents, which you are, uh, when we have that baby and, you know, our wife has that baby, thankfully it's not us, uh, has that baby. And, and, um, we look at that baby and we have all kinds of hopes and dreams and, um, things in our head for what that baby's going to be like. And, um, and we never want our baby to be sick or, um, in any way have trouble. We don't even want our baby to cry. Um, and yet, um, things happen, right? Um, but in your story, uh, it just intrigues me because it didn't start right away. It started when you were about four years old. So if you can, let's pick up that story there when you're, uh, when your folks took you to the doctor. So Russ, my parents, well, first, uh, thank you for having me, Russ. And, I know that your podcast is encouraging and inspiring and blessing lots of people. So thank you for doing it and thank you for having me on. And I like to tell people that uh, I'm a firm believer, Russ, and it's the three F's, uh, you, you know, overcome the, the, the challenge of a, a, re- a diagnosis of, of retinitis pigmentosa. It takes uh, the three F's, faith, family, and friends, Russ, faith, family, and friends. And I'm privileged to call you a friend. And I would say that uh, I was born in, in Belleville, New Jersey. Uh, I, I came in this world uh, with uh, uh, nothing, and I, I've, I've got all of it left. And, um, <laughs> and um, so um, my, my parents knew that I had a problem. I couldn't focus. I, I, they knew that I, I had a problem with my eyes. They, they weren't sure what, but, you know, that Russ, you know, I didn't know, like, you, you know, when, 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 you know, like I didn't know I couldn't I had a problem with my eyes. I didn't figure that out until I got into school and learned that, you know, other people were reading print and I was kind of had to, you know, read, learn other ways because my mother taught me to read like all the letters with the magnetic letters on the refrigerator. You know, mm. my mother was a possibility thinker, Russ, and we're going to see a theme of that throughout this podcast, possibility thinkers possibility mm-hmm. thinkers and possibility doers. So at Russ, when I was four years old, they, they finally, they, they brought me to doctors in New York. They brought me to doctors in Pennsylvania. They brought me to doctors in New Jersey. And finally, this one, one doctor said, Mr. and Mrs. Dino Taris, we've determined your son has an eye condition, retinitis pigmentosa. And he said, David, can you see what this is? And I said, no. He said, oh, that, that's a big E. That's a big E. Uh, David, how about this? You know what this is? And I, I go, no. He goes, David, how old are you? And I said, four years old. He said, do you know that's a picture of a birthday cake? I'm like, no. He said, can you get closer to it? And I'm like, uh-huh. Can you see it now? No, not 
Not really. Well, so Mr. and Mrs. Dana Terrace, and now we're sitting on my mother's lap now, Russ. David has an eye condition, retinitis pigmentosa. And Russ, he went on to tell my parents all the things I wasn't going to be able to do. Mm. And I, I'm not really sure why some experts feel the need to do that. He's not going right. to be able to learn like the, the regular kids. He's not going to get an education like the rest of the I remember him saying this. And uh, he's not going to be able to get an education like the normal kids. The normal kids. He's not going to be able right. to play sports like the normal kids. He's not. And, and then, you know, he went on all these things. And then um, I remember. I love that you know, normal, right? David, I know that normal, right? right? I mean, you have three kids. Yeah. Like, okay, normal is such a, a crazy term to use when describing children, right? I mean, uh, yep. there's so many variables. But anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt. But yeah, normal is a, is just a crazy word. Right, right. And, and so, you know, like... Um, you know, Russ, I, I, uh, I remember like b- because of that, like I know I'm gonna. I, I tried so hard to be quote, you know, like you know, air quotes, normal. Mm-hmm. I tried so hard to be normal, and then I, I, I realized, Russ, Russ, if people are taking notes, here's a good one. I tried so hard to be different, um, and I just like to encourage people to try really hard to be yourself, Mm. you know, Um, be yourself, Russ, everybody else is taken, but I, I I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be like everybody else. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to fit in, not to sit out, you know, and, you know, so I was at the doctor's and the doctor and my, my 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 dad was like rifling questions. What about glasses? What context? There's gonna be something you could do. And the doctor interrupted my father, Mr. Dean Taris, there's nothing you or anybody else could do. Your son's gonna go blind. And uh, you know, we, you just have to help him figure out what he's gonna do. Hmm. So I remember leaving the doctor's office that day, Russ. I was holding my mother's hand and we were walking down the long corridor and no one was saying anything. And I remember we got in the elevator and we went down the elevator. And no one said anything. And I remember we went into the big car, you know, garage and no one said anything. And we're just walking along. And like, you know, I thought it was odd that no one was saying anything. Hmm. I guess as everyone's just processing this information, your son's going to go blind and there's nothing you can do about it. I guess that's a lot to process. So, you know, we, I, my, my mom, you know, put me in the back seat of the car and, and uh, she got in the passenger seat. And my dad got in the driver's seat and uh, lit up a cigarette. And my mother says, Dante, what are we going to do now? And the doctor said, Joan, we're not going to listen to that expert. We're going to find the experts to help our son lead a normal life. Hmm. Russ. I, I, you know, like th- thinking about that now, like, like, I don't know if that was audacity or faith or what, but like getting like a diagnosis like that and to say, we're not going to listen to that expert. We're going to, and Russ, that was like, I remember Russ, like that, that took this, like that took this weight off of me when I was this little kid, like, oh, Okay. We're not going to listen to that expert. We're going to find the experts to, to figure this out. And so, Russ, if there's a handle that I could put on, you know, I, I love the minister, Dr. Cook. I don't know if any of you listeners ever listened to Dr. Cook and Walk with the King Ministries. And he, he would say, I want to put a handle on this concept for you so you could take it with you where you live, work, and play. And so mm-hmm. if there was a handle I could put on a concept for anybody – it, it, it is spend your time with possibility thinkers, spend your time with people who are helping you figure things out how. And Russ, I was just telling my daughter this the other day. Right. Um, but you just sorry to interrupt with your daughter, but it, it, that's right there. You're talking about your parents' reaction. Yes. You know, during, during that, that those moments, right. That was, um, 
you know, there's a big message there, right? The, be, the, yes. the message, right, is is not just for you as a kid, right? But the message was, as parents, goodness gracious, okay, we got a diagnosis. All right, we're going to figure this out. We're going to somehow, yep. we're going to yep. figure this out. And, yes. and, and, you know, whatever tools they had way back then, um, your folks had whatever your, you know, their education, their connections, anything, it all came into play. Like, Hey, this is our boy, man. We're going to, we're going to yep. figure this out. All right. And we're not going to yes. be, you know, we're not going to, you know, put the pressure on him. We're going to encourage him. We're going to build him up and we're going to figure it out. Okay. Mm-hmm. The pressure's on us, but we're not going to, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to burden our son, right, with this. Yes. Russ, I love it. You know, I just wrote down. And Russ, like I, I know that some people are, are watching, some are listening. This is my Braille display. This is what I take notes on. Uh-huh. So, you know, you, you can't just think it. You got to ink it, right? You got to write things down. And I wrote down, um, you know, don't don't just freak out. Figure it out. Don't freak, yes. don't, don't freak out. Figure it out. Like, we can't freak out. And Russ, you know, I, I heard someone say this too, like a lot of times, um, you know, our our relationship with with God or higher power, whatever your higher power you call, I call my higher power God. But like a lot of times, y- y- your relationship with your your parents when you're younger, it, I, I think really shapes your, your whole perspective and you know my dad just was a you know he 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 brought us to church he read the bible he could quote bible verses he helped me believe that he told me david you're going to truly figure out what it means to walk by faith and not by sight and mm-hmm. he a- allowed me to meet other people who were successful russ who and like you know, he just, wh- wherever it was, wherever it was, he helped me meet people. He brought me to work one day to meet a secretary who was deaf. And mm. I said, well, why do you want me to meet her, Dad? Well, I-, I want you to meet her because, you know, deafness isn't stopping her. And, and then mm. he, met, he, he met me, meet another ge- gentleman, Mike. And Mike was an accountant. And Mike was in a wheelchair. And mm. I well, why do you need Mike? Well, you know, Mike... I want you to meet Mike and, and, and you, you, you can find out how he does his job. And Russ, you know, he, and then when I was nine years old, he took me out of school to go speak to the Montclair Lions Club. And I said, what do they want to hear about? He said, they want to hear about how you do your work and how you play gym. And they, just, and so Russ, you know, it was that day that I learned that I love speaking in front of groups. <laughs> You're right. We haven't been able to stop you ever since. Right, right. <laughs> All right. So, Dad. Okay. So, the, so obviously, Dad and Mom set not not just the uh, verbally and emotionally, but set the physical home environment to support you. Right, which is all important. For, yes. You yes. know, whatever kind of kids you got, the home environment. Right, the attitude, everything that goes together. But then. Okay, your dad decides. What was that term he used about when you went to regular school instead of the school for the blind? Mainstreamed, mainstream, mainstream right? So you're getting, mainstream. you're getting mainstream, but that brought its own challenges, right? But there was this great story yeah. about that uh, taking gym class when you always had to sit on the side for gym class until, until Russ. One day, um, you know. Uh, I, I, I just hated, um, recess because, you know, rest, you know, growing up in Belleville, New Jersey, we didn't have the big grassy fields. We had the black top with the, the yellow bases painted on the basketball courts painted on the tennis courts painted on the, you know, the, 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 the football end zone painted on, we had everything painted on the black top, you know? And, but I just, <laughs> I really couldn't see enough to play any of the ball sports. So when we, we had to go outside and, you know, my fourth grade teacher, Miss Petrillo, would say, well, what would you like to do? Everyone was, oh, let's go outside and play softball. And I was like, oh, God, I, I didn't really want to do that because I always, you know, have to kind of sit on the side. And, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't make a big deal out of it. I just sat on the side. And um, 
So one day, Miss Petrillo said, David, we're going to play a softball, but um, I, I have an idea. And I was wondering if you'd want to try. And I said, what's that, Miss Petrillo? She said, I'll bounce the ball. Couldn't do this on a grassy field. I'll bounce the ball up to the plate and it'll bounce once, it'll bounce twice. And the second time, then you, you hear it and you could hit it. I said, yeah, yeah. So uh, she, she bounced. She, okay, class, everyone be quiet. Because, you know, gym class, you know, ninth graders, everybody's screaming. Everyone be quiet. Okay. Bounce the ball once, bounce the ball twice, swing, miss, bounce the ball once, bounce the ball twice, swing, bounce the ball once, bounce the ball I hit, Russ, I hit it. I really hit it. I hit it good. And It you is know, high. It is far. It is gone. Right. It is gone. <laughs> An A-bomb from – oh, that was – a long time ago. <laughs> so um, uh, Yankee fans and John Sterling. And yes. Uh, so um, I, and I hit it. I was able to run the first and I was in the game, Russ. I was in the game. And she said, Dave, mm. you got to keep your ear on the ball. Dave, you mm. got to keep your ear on the ball. Right. Oh, that's so good. And I was able to play and I was able to play. And then, uh, you know, Russ, you know, uh, she helped me fit in and not sit out and fitting in Russ, like helping kids fit in, helping everyone fit in is up there with food, shelter and water belonging and fitting in. Like, what are we going to do to make people feel like they can fit in and welcome? And right, so, right. so she was really good. Russ, 30 years later, I got a phone call from Miss Petrillo. I didn't know this, Russ. It was her first year teaching. So this wasn't an you know, expert savvy teacher. She was just a possibility thinker. Yeah, yeah. I got a phone call from her 30 years later. She said, David, I, how you doing? I said, good, Miss Petrillo, how are you? She said, great, David, I, I have an exciting story to tell you. So what's that? She said, remember we used to, used to play Keep Your Ear on the Ball? I said, yeah. She said, I wrote an article for Scholastics Magazine, a parent's magazine. And they picked up the story. And so, the, you know, it was published. I said, oh, that's so cool. Good for you. She said, well, wait, there's more. I said, what? She goes, I got a phone call from a company, Toll House Publishing, and they want to publish a book, Keep Your Ear on the Ball. And I'm wondering if you're okay with that and we can use your name. And I said, oh, my God, Miss Petrillo. Yes, of course. Russ, I've been uh, all over the country in Colorado and different places, and people are like, you're that, David? I've, I've made my students read that book, right? Nice. Because, you know, it was the kid, they, you know, David in the book, he didn't really want a lot of help, Russ. Right. He wanted to do things himself. I don't know right. if you know anybody like this. He wanted to do yeah. things himself. But then once he accepted help, things got really better fast. Sure. Yeah. And, and okay, so – there's there's these places for you, you know, to step off and experience. Okay, but you knew deep down that you were not going to get a tryout for the Yankees, even though you hit the ball, right? But, I, I I I did, but I always dreamed I could be the second baseman. <laughs> but but then, not too long after, right in middle school, then you're introduced to something you can do a physical sport that you can do. Tell us about that situation. Cause that, that really brings uh, like the physical aspect. I mean, anyway, go, I, I don't want to jump on it, but go ahead. Tell that story. So, you know, Russ, I, I I'd love to share that story, but I, I just need to share one other story before I, I share that story. Okay. So um, you have a copy of my book, feeling your way through life. And on the I'm cover holding of that it up book, right now. There you go. On the cover of that book is, is, is a beach ball. Yeah. So Russ, one day, Russ, I, I, I got a phone call from my dad and I was, I was in fourth grade and he called me on the phone. Now, Russ, my dad, he didn't have any advanced degrees like, like many of your listeners. He was a health inspector in Montclair, New Jersey, as a matter of fact, Russ, he had three jobs. He was the health inspector in Montclair, New Jersey. He worked at the post office and he worked at the VA in East Orange. He had three three jobs and su supported uh, six kids. Awesome. And whatever so, it takes. Whatever it takes, right, Russ? Whatever it takes. Uh, no, no complaints, you know. And so, Russ, one day he called me on the phone. He said, David, when I come home from work today, 
I'm going to teach you how to play catch. Russ, I knew I couldn't see a baseball or a football or a basketball. And that day I worried. I hmm. worried. What did I worry about, Russ? I worried I wasn't going to be able to play. I worried I was going to let him down. That was the worst one. Yeah. Uh, I worried I was going to disappoint him. Uh, I was worried I was going to get hurt. You know, Russ, they say 90, 95% of the things we worry about never happen anyway. 95% mm -hmm. of the things never happen anyway. So, Russ, I, you know, I learned like – you know, what like worry is like sitting in a rocking chair, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Right. Yeah, and and, and um, it, it's like, it's like worship. Don't worry. Right. Worship. Don't worry. You know, pray, don't panic. Worship. Don't worry. Pray, don't panic. And, um, but that day I worried, Russ, I worried so much. I, 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 I actually made myself sick. Well, mm. uh, the, 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 the I hear, the car drove up the driveway. I hear the screen door open. The dogs bark. I said, okay. David, I said, hey, Dad. He says, all right, I'm going to get changed. We'll go play catch. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and Russ, we go in the backyard. And that day, he brought home a giant beach ball. Yes. It was so big, I couldn't even get my arms around it. And Russ, he would hit this ball up in the air. And I was able to see the red and the yellow and the blue and the green against the light blue sky. And Russ, he knew that all I could see is contrast, light on dark and dark on light. And he, I, I, I was able to reach up and catch the ball. And he said, David, you stop right there. I said, yeah, that. He said, David, I'm not teaching you how to play catch. He said, I'm teaching you that you can do whatever you want. You've just got to spend your time figuring out how. Mm. And Russ, that go. was like, that was like the the, uh, uh, the green light for me, or the like the turning point for me, is I can do whatever I want. I just have to spend my time figuring out how, because a lot of times, Russ, we spend our time figuring out all the things we can't do, and we 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 focus on all the all the things we lost and all the things I could have did or should have did. And we focus on that rather than focusing on figuring it out. And so you can do whatever you want, David. You've just got to spend your time figuring out how. And what a message that was for me, Russ. Like that, that was like, okay, I've got to, t I, he said to me one day, Russ, I remember on a car ride home, Dave, any common gorilla could figure out all the things you can't hey, do as a blind person. David. Yeah. We're going to have yes. to redo that one segment. Uh, your internet was cutting out. It was all garbled. Uh -oh. So oh, you're um, just go from where uh, your dad said you can, uh, you just have to figure things out. Just, just start whenever you're ready. Just start there. I don't know why it cut yeah. out for about 30 seconds. Okay. Well, I'm very sorry. Um, no worries. He told me that you can do whatever you want. You've just got to spend your time figuring out how. And Russ, that was such a, a green light for me. Like, wow, focusing on that, like focusing on that rather than focusing on, uh, you know, all the things I can't do. A lot, of, And a lot of times we default to, you know, all the things we lost, all the, you know, I lost, I'm losing more eyesight. I'm losing more. I, I've lost my job. I've lost my, my, my husband. I lost this relationship. I, and we focus on, I lost my friend. I lost, I didn't get the team. I didn't get the, and we focus on all the things we lost, Russ. And it's so important that we, Russ, this is one of the things I learned from my dad. And, and it really might be the most important thing I learned from him. Here it is. If you're taking notes, here it is. Things turn out the best for people who make the best of the way things turn out. Mm -hmm. Things turn out the best for people who make the best of the way things turn out. If you could make the – Russ, he told me this too. He told me that, ready, 
oh, this is a this is this is a keeper. He told me that blindness was going to make me bitter or better, and I better pick the right one. Bro, goodness gracious. Yes, sir. Blindness was going to make me bitter or better. Yeah. I better pick the right one. So I don't know what – I don't know. I'll just – just to, to, to wrap this up, I don't know what your listeners are going through. I don't know what physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual challenge they're going through right now, but I can tell you this. It's going to make you bitter or better. You better pick the right one. Oh, yeah. Hey, David, just in saying that, since it was it was a gradual loss, what yes. can you – and again, I, you know, obviously I'm cited, so it's it, this might be just a stupid question – no. But out of the, out of all the senses, like which I was always led to believe that if something happened, if you lost one of your senses, the other ones would would increase or pick up. Could you tell um, what you know what picked up? Was it taste, smell, hearing? Um, you know, touch? What did something? Well, was it comp, was there a compensation there or no? I just think that they're, uh, you know, Russ, I, I, I like to use the example of, um, you know, if there's a problem with your car and you bring it to the mechanic and he says, or she says, starts it up and then, oh, yeah, oh, you, you need a new belt. You know, I, I can't hear any better than you, Russ, but I've mm-hmm. just really fine tuned, um, you know, uh, you, you know all about muscle memory. And mm-hmm. and so I have really fine, well-trained uh, listening skills. I have, okay. you know, I am paying attention more. Uh, I, I don't think I can, you know, I like to say, I, I don't know if I smell better than you. I probably do smell better than you, Russ. I, I don't know. Just, but um, <laughs> An Italian from Belleville? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah That's exactly. Nice, can, the nice garlic you can, scent. You can you well, smell you the garlic from here, right? You can smell the garlic <laughs> from there, right? And so... Um, you know, like I don't, I, I don't have a, a, a better sense of smell than you. I don't have better hearing than you. I don't have be- better sense of touch. But I, I have really worked very hard, um, my, you know, to make sure I'm paying attention to those skills. You know, like gotcha. I'll say, I'll probably notice something like, you know, oh, do you, you smell that, uh, you know, smell of whatever it is. You know, like being living in Hershey, Pennsylvania, Russ, depending on which way the wind's blowing, it could be the chocolate or the horse manure. Uh, but <laughs> I'll, I'll probably, I'll smell that first. And then, you know, my wife or whoever will be, like, oh yeah, yeah, I smell that. Unless you're looking for it or paying attention for it. But a lot right, of times right. I think, um, you know, they, they say, you know, we get 85% of the information from our eyes. So you're constantly paying attention with your eyes and, Maybe not as much uh, with your ears, and you know our ears are three hundred and sixty. You know they're hearing information all around us. Your eyes are, you know, pretty much you know like one hundred and eighty here. So right. you know, using your just uh, I. So I don't believe that I um, my I can hear better than you. I think my I just my my listening muscles uh, are are a little right. more focused uh, exercise than yours. So Russ, I got to tell you. Another don't forget story. the muscles part, though, uh, the real uh, uh, David Dina Terrace beach muscles part. Okay, don't forget yes, that story. Well, I just don't want no, you to forget no, that. No, no, we won't. We won't. So, Russ, uh, I, I, I had, um, you know, fourth, fifth grade. I had some, you know, just great teachers. And when I was in fourth grade, my gym teacher who was a gentleman by the name of Phil Grapaldi. Is a gentleman by the name of Phil Grapaldi. Mr. Capaldi was a, a, a world champion weightlifter uh, from Belleville, New Jersey. Uh, and, you know, I really admired him. He, everybody mm-hmm. did. He was, you know, he had, he had muscles on muscles and, you know, <laughs> like, you know, he, he loved to, you know, and he let you know, my brothers lifted weights with him and, you know, just, he was just, you know, just, it was, it was just amazing, you know, like, that it was 1978 and, you know, he was in the 1976 Olympics. He's my gym teacher. And, you know, wow. so That's just so one cool. day, one day during, one day during gym class, he knew about Miss Petrillo and the keep your ear on the ball, but he 
he wanted, he thought I could hit the ball, you know, without bouncing it. You know, he, we didn't need to do that, Russ. So he, so he oh would boy. just, you know, he was maybe, you know, 20 feet away. And then uh, he would move a little closer, you know, 10 feet away. And now Russ, we're playing softball and he's tossing it up to me. And now maybe he's six feet away. Oh, right. It's danger so zone. Russ, just now we're in the danger zone, Russ. So he's like, Dave, <laughs> now can you, we're in the danger zone. So Russ, you know, he now five feet away and he tosses that, this, this nice red uh, softball. And, and, and I got all of it, Russ. I got all of it. And it went off. I was told it went off the top of his forehead. And he goes, <laughs> run! <laughs> run! You know? And uh, so he was like, he would put himself, he, he put himself out there so I could fit in too. So I've had all these teachers, Russ, who like, they want the extra mile for me. And Russ, like, you know, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of Nike, to be honest with you, but they, they have some great slogans and there's no competition on the extra mile. And, you know, he went mm. the extra mile for me. So I had him as a gym teacher in fourth grade and fifth grade. But then in seventh grade, Russ, I went to the middle school. And like during gym class, you know, it was very loud, all these kids. And, and uh, you know, um, the principal, uh, Mario DiMaggio, not everyone from Belleville's Italian, Russell. Just so we know, I'm going to clear that up right away. <laughs> not everyone. Else. So Mario DiMaggio and Dr. Saccone. <laughs> uh, met with my father and Mr. Capaldi. So maybe in this case uh, they they were, but <laughs> not not every case. All right. Oh my so, gosh. So uh, Mr. Capaldi says, Mr. Dina Terrace, it's you know the gym is very very loud, and it's just not the best place for your son. I want to get your son, uh, it, it, you know, involved in uh, exercise and uh, weightlifting. Uh, so instead of him taking gym class, you know, fourth and fifth period, I'm going to right next to the gym is, is the weight, a weight room where there's pull up machine, there's pull ups and there's weights in there and there's all, all kinds of exercise equipment. And, and I'll, I'm going to help him in there. And hmm. Russ, he did it during his break period. Wow. So, you know, he, he you know, he, he couldn't do it during gym class because everybody else, but he did it during break period. So they arranged my schedule. So during his break period, he could take me to the gym and get me involved in doing push-ups and chin-ups and and um, um, you just uh, all, all push-ups, sit-ups, chin-ups, dips. You know, a lot of body weight get, stuff. Yep, he didn't get me involved in weightlifting until ninth grade. Okay, but he told me I would, and then in ninth grade, you know, he, he got me involved in. In, in lifting weights and he start, we started with dumbbells and then, you know, learning forms. And before we first started with a broomstick, yeah. Russ, we first started with a broomstick and this is what we're going to teach you all the, all the motions with David. And then like, and then, and then he told me, go home and do these motions with your brothers. Make sure did they you, know. How so to it was a, did he teach you Olympic style weightlifting or was it more powerlifting? No, no. He got me involved in the power lifting for whatever reason, Russ. Okay. Well, and it just I, uh, the, the Olympic lifting was, you know, I mean, your, your weights are flying through space. There's a lot less control there. Yes. Yeah. I, so he, you know, the first thing he started me doing was, uh, you know, squats. And he mm -hmm. said, you can learn this, David. This is going to be very important for your balance. Oh, yeah. Your balance. We got to think about your balance, Dave. So he got me doing squats and then, you know, like with, with, with no weights, just like bouncing on your heels, you know, mm -hmm. and then coming up and then throwing your hips forward. And like, he would, you know, like here, here, feel my, feel, feel my hips, feel, feel where my shoulders are, feel where my neck is, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, some people might say, Oh, I don't know. But like, he, that, that was the only way I was going to get it. Gonna you learn, know? Yeah. Well, Russ, you know, he, um, you know, he, you know, he was like, but you know, Russ, when you're around people who are like, Mr. Capaldi, how much can you leg press? 800 pounds, 800, 800 pounds. Yeah. Can I see you do it on Thursdays? I'm going to do it on Thursdays. I do leg presses and, you know, and then people will come to the gym to see him like do leg presses, you know, and then squats, you know, 600 pound rack squats, you know, 
And like, and mm. we were all encouraged. We were all encouraged by him. And, you know, and he told me, Dave, you know, you, you know, you're not going to be the center fielder. You're not going to be the wide receiver, but you know, with weights, you got to even level playing field. Mm. You got a level yeah, playing yeah. field. Dave. So like, so Russ, he told me about level playing fields before anyone ever told me about educational playing fields or employment level playing fields for people with disabilities. He was, mm. you know, he was telling me about that when I was 14 years old, a level playing field. Now I yeah. have a level playing field, you know, it's not a level. You put me on a baseball field. It's not a level field. You put me right. on a basketball court. It's not a level field. You put me in, in the gym with the weights. It's just me and gravity. Bring it on. Yeah. Yeah, so, it, it took you off the sidelines, right? It put you in the game, right? It, it, it did, Russ. You it know, helped me and fit I, I in think, and not sit out. Right, and I think a lot of people, sighted, unsighted, but depending on, you know, athleticism, depend, all these variables, you know, parents forcing their kids into a particular sport because everybody oh. else is doing it. And it's just, you know, it's a waste of time and probably a ton of frustration for the kid. But like you said, yes. you know, hey, uh, there was there was an environment there that you got fired up about being a part of. It was yes. – and, and like you said, it was something that you could succeed at. You're energized by that. But you still had to put in the hard work. It wasn't like, oh, oh yes. I'm here and I'm the superstar. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just here and I have an opportunity to be a superstar, right? Yes. Oh, you know, Russ, like I, I, you know, like I remember uh, asking him one day, I said, Mr. Capaldi, is it true that you, you, you can't work out seven days a week? Oh yeah. Dave, uh, Dave, you know, Dave, yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. You know who says that Dave losers say that Dave losers say that you can work out <laughs> seven days a week. And, and, uh, you know, so, good. He, 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 so, so, so good. Like just the story, Rush. you know, like the, the stories from, the the uh, stadium uh, where we lifted weights, you know, and the history there, and the you know, we didn't have, you know, the 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 beautiful workout facilities. It was like, you know, like Russ, we had this one, you know, we had this one thing. It was a a metal can filled with cement with a bar sticking out of it mm-hmm. and like you know wh- what is this for it, it, it was for shrugs sure it was for yeah and you know it's just you know somebody made this metal can with cement with a crowbar sticking out of it and it was for shrugs and, oh, and you know gracious. they said yeah. this was oh this, this has been here for 30 years 30 years, right? This cement, you know, and people would come up with, you know, and then like, you know, uh, and then the rest, they had the, the wooden, um, uh, you know, so you could stand and do deadlifts on, on the, on the, like the um, platform, mm-hmm. you know, and they, and they built the platform in, in, in wood shop glass. Sure. You know, oh, yeah. right? I mean, and it was just like, that was there for who knows how many years. And like, Did you so, get, at what age did you start to compete and, and how, like, you, did you get to travel with that too? I did. Uh, so when, uh, when I was in ninth grade, Mr. Capaldi encouraged me to get involved with the association of drug free power lifters. And like, I did my first, um, you know, bench press competition, you know, at, uh, 123 pounds. And then, um, you know, I competed at, at 123 and 132 and then 148. And that mm-hmm. was many tuna melts ago, Russ. Just so. <laughs> there you go. But, and, uh, but, but, but I, you I, traveled though, right? Didn't you do some kind of world championship? I somewhere? did. I did. I did. I, I started with, you know, I started with like, you know, drug free and then, you know, competed against a, a, and the, Russ, you know, when I started competing with the association, New Jersey association of drug-free powerlifting, that's when I learned Russ and I didn't know, but that's when I learned that I could compete and win against sighted kids. Yeah. That's when I got the message. I can do this. I, and I, not only I can do this, but I could win. Well, Russ, 
there, you know, there's something about helping kids learn that they look, you know, you learn w- more from losing than you do from winning. I know that, but you learn a lot from winning too. And so oh, yeah. when I learned that I, and you don't win, need eyeballs to lift heavy weights, right? I mean, you no. don't need, so it, 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 it really like says, you know, there's, there's all those messages coming to you. Like, wait a minute, I'm different. I'm disabled. Yep. I'm blind. Yep. Who's going to like me? Where am I going to fit in? Right. But now, like now you're getting this message that, okay, you know, in the right setting, Hey, I'm uh you know, this is my place. Right. And I, uh, I, I can compete. Yep. I can compete yeah. and I can win. And Russ, I learned when, you know, whatever is necessary, whatever is necessary. Right. So if it means, you know, you know, uh, you know, we're, we got to lose weight. If it means um, anything like uh, it, Russ, is that is that OK? I, I I heard your computer make a noise. Are you OK? No, we're good. We're good. Oh, good. Okay. Um whatever is necessary. So like win W whatever is necessary. And so if it means, you know, like I, Russ, I, I love, you know, like, you know, like people, people think, you know, I'd love your take on this Russ, but people t- think that discipline is a negative word. It, it, and hmm. it is, I mean, have you found that in all of your work now, Russ, but like discipline isn't a negative word, is it? No, I mean, I think, you know, that was, oh my goodness, a massive power outage up in Pennsylvania just took out David. I'm hoping we can go further with this conversation in the future. But to answer his question that he asked me about discipline, there are two types, right? One from within and one outside us. Self-discipline can be learned and improved, which David's life definitely demonstrates. And external discipline, discipline is essential, but not always fun. Rules, parameters, and discipline all come into play, but ultimately, we come to discover that learning that our actions have consequences is a very good thing. And then David went on to win a world championship, world weightlifting championship while in college, and also met his future bride there as well. And that story is amazing. It's in his book. Um, So to recap, remember, parents and kids, when you come across a person with a disability, of course, you would help someone who could use some help but don't pity them. We all need help. My old friend, who was arguably the strongest man ever lived, Paul Anderson, said this, if the strongest man in the world can't get through one day without the power of Jesus Christ, where does that leave you? And also, David's mom and dad were possibility thinkers. That's an intentional way to live, and it's something we should all consider. I know I did when my kids were young. And uh, also, too, with doctors... (laughs) I like that uh, that part about uh, David's parents got taken him to the doctor for that diagnosis. Hey, doctor, there's nothing parents can do, and uh, you know his parents had a, it was kind of his the response was pretty awesome in that. Um, yeah, well, you're the doctor, and we respect that. However, uh, we need to own the health of our child and seek out solutions. And that could be from a number of different sources, because we know in life, everything comes down to physical, intellectual, psychological, emotional, and spiritual. And, uh, and from then, maybe you can decide what is normal. Um, and as David said, try hard to be yourself. Walk by faith, not by sight. So obvious in his case. And he also talked about a level playing field for those with disabilities. And that, that reminded me when he was talking about his early weightlifting experiences, Um, I know traditional sports can be, depending on the disability, can be a real challenge for uh, young people or anybody. But this uh, Pastor Pete, he uh, grew up in the area uh, where David did. I think he's a little bit older. He is a little bit older. Uh, But he grew up in that same weightlifting atmosphere. He was an Olympic style lifter as well as a power lifter. And after he became a pastor, he also, um, he opened up his garage and he started training young people that came to see him lift. And he developed a concept called the True Strength Club. And it grew over the next year or two um, where the local high school kids who didn't, weren't athletes like varsity athletes that they could just go in and use the facilities at the local public high school. These are kids that, um, you know, were outside of traditional sports and they, but they wanted to become strong. 
and healthy. And um, so Pastor Pete, you know, they set up a gym. It ultimately it ended up in the basement of the church. And I remember at one point he was getting like 70 uh, kids a week coming in there and um, they would have competitions a few times a year. I know because my daughter, uh, when she was a basketball player, but she competed in one of those competitions and it was just awesome. The purity of it, after we watch all the nonsense that goes on in, in a lot of our popular quote unquote sports today, um, where you just follow the money, but the purity of it, and, and I know I, I went to a couple of competitions because uh, they invited me to uh, present in between uh, lifts and stuff. And at the end of the day, the last lift in a powerlifting meet is the deadlift. And that's basically just pulling the heaviest weight you can off the floor. And when the judge says it's a good lift, you can drop it. And you had to see these kids. I mean, some like it, for me, the biggest lift might have been 100 pounds, but it didn't matter who whose team I was on. That lift was going to be my personal best. And the, the camaraderie, the support that I would get for lifting that 100 pounds was amazing. And the next person up might lift 500 pounds. And it would be the same thing because they were going for their personal best. So it, it might be a, a sport activity to look into uh, if you're a parent of, of, a, of a kid that maybe just can't do the traditional sports. That's all I'm saying. Um, and that great quote from uh, David's old school teacher uh, when she figured out how David could finally hit the ball, right? Keep your ear on the ball. And uh, that's a wrap. I hope everyone enjoyed today's episode and we got some takeaways that you can use. You can grab a copy of David's book on Amazon and for speaking engagements, you can find him speaking engagements. You can find him on LinkedIn or his website. This is a great one. www.possibilitythinkers.net. And um, here's a copy of his book. If you're looking for it, just look for that big beach ball. All right. Cause you can see that through uh, the sun shines through it and you can see it. If you can see, uh, you know, light colors and textures. And please share this with your friends. And don't forget, all my stuff is at russelljonespeaks.com. If you're a parent or grandparent or mentor to a 10 to 15 year old, check out our 60 day transformational interactive video series, Top Secrets to Success for Kids and Parents. And in the words of the inimitable Hulk Hogan, say your prayers, take your vitamins, and you'll never go wrong. Then go and all go and everybody go and make it a great day. And I hope the weather improves up in Pennsylvania. All right. Be blessed. Bye for now.